Good afternoon. Welcome to this regular meeting of Council of the Municipality of Jasper for August 16th. Before we begin, we should deal with the elephant in the room. Congratulate uh, Councillor Hall and the Bone Stars for the, the victory. Um, I did note earlier that um, Councillor Hall identified the team as her team, whereas CAO Given referred to the Royals as the team for which he plays. He didn't take any ownership, but congratulations in any event um, to Councillor Hall and the Bowling Stars, even though they defeated my son and the, the brew pub team in the finals. But uh, it, was, it was a good weekend of, of ball for the entire community. Uh, Councillors, you have today's agenda in a new format and I've heard some comments. I think they've all been positive about the, the new format um, recommended by the legislative committee and authorized by council um, last month um, to set aside some of our existing um, procedural requirements in our procedure bylaw to test drive a new agenda um, until the end of this year. So just pay attention if you would in the coming meetings to make sure that the new format of the agenda is serving us um, in the way that was intended because changes can still be made as we move forward. Are there any additions, deletions or other changes to be made to the agenda? If there are not, I, I will simply add, we don't have to change the agenda, but I had invited our member of parliament, Mr. Soroka, who is in town and currently um, presenting a jubilee um, pinned to a resident um, and will join us approximately two o'clock, but whatever stage we're at, we will interrupt to, to welcome Mr. Soroka. Other than that, might I have a motion, please, that council approve the agenda for today's meeting as presented. Councilor Melnick, all those in favor? There are none opposed, that is carried. We have two sets of minutes to approve as we now do at regular meetings. Firstly, the minutes of the regular meeting of July 19th, 2022, which are an attachment to today's agenda. Are there any errors, omissions, or corrections required to be made to those minutes? If there are none, may I have a motion, please, this, that council approve the minutes of the July 19, 19th, 2022 regular council meeting as presented. Councillor Waxer, thank you. All those in favor? There are none opposed, that is carried. And also attached to today's agenda are the minutes of the Committee of the Whole meeting of August 9th. Are there any errors, omissions, or corrections required to be made to those minutes? If there are none, might I have a motion, please, that Council approve the minutes of the August 9th, 2022 Committee of the Whole meeting as presented. Councillor Wilson, thank you. All those in favor? There are none opposed. That is carried. Agenda item four, correspondence. Uh, we have nothing for consideration specifically on our agenda today, so we can move to agenda item five, which is delegations. And we are visited today um, from Aquaterra, who provides wastewater services for us. We have uh, Laura Brennan, Sarah Bell, and Vaughn Bend. And Mr. Bend, you are at the microphone. So I We'll let you decide whether you push the button or pass it to your left or to your right, but uh, welcome all of you. And thank you for your attendance. There's luck. Uh, so uh, thank you very much uh, uh, for your time today, Mayor Ireland, uh, councillors. Uh, we really do appreciate it. Uh, my name is Vaughn Bend. I'm the CEO of Aquaterra Utilities Incorporated. I have two colleagues with me today. For the tough questions, I'll talk and then uh, I've got 
uh, two very intelligent colleagues here to help me with some of the tough questions. So to my left is Laura Brennan, who's our Chief Operating Officer at Ontario Utilities. And to my right is Sarah Ball, who is the Manager of our Water and Wastewater Treatment Facility in uh, Grand Prairie. So again, thank you very much. We've uh, prepared a short presentation for you today. Uh, thank you for the time to be able to talk to you about uh, our operation here in Jasper. And we're really excited about being here. So thank you very much. Uh, just going to step through the presentation. I, I find the, the, the most important part, the most engaging part is, is the questions. And we've got some time at the end here, hopefully, to answer any of your questions. So if, with your permission, I'll just step through our presentation. Yes, thank you. We go to the first page of the agenda. We're just going to cover a few things off here. Uh, I'm going to talk briefly, just a quick introduction. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about Aquatera itself. I know this is our first one of uh, hopefully many of these uh, events. And I'm going to talk a little bit about Aquatera, uh, some of the benefits and strategy uh, of our company, uh, industry challenges, because I think we're all facing very similar challenges. And I think it's important that at least we just take a minute or so just to highlight some of the ones that we see going forward here in the industry generally talk a lot about the favorite topic is our favorite client is obviously Jasper. And so we're going to talk a little bit about Jasper and Aquaterra since we started operating here uh, a little over a year ago. Uh, talk about the performance because I know as we got together, the Jasper, the municipality of Jasper and uh, also Aquaterra, we came up with some performance criteria we thought would be make sense to uh, monitor how we're doing here and, and how you see our performance. Talk a little bit about that. Talk quickly on some performance uh, opportunities, some improvements maybe we can make and, and some things we want to look look forward to doing here as we go forward. And then obviously some questions. So hopefully that works for you folks as well. If I can get the next slide up, please. Just quickly talk about Aquaterra, just a little bit about us. And I know you know a little bit about us, but uh, we're the leading provider of water, wastewater, and solid waste services in the Grand Prairie region, and we were established in 2003. We're municipally owned uh, with extensive experience of providing services to both public, private, and industrial sectors, and we serve a customer base of around 100,000 people. We operate and maintain a level three water and level four water, wastewater treatment facilities, including all the pump houses, the reservoirs, the lift stations, and the associated lagoons, and over 1,300 kilometers of water and sewer distribution and collection pipelines. We also operate in our solid waste uh, side, we operate a level two fire reactor landfill, gas collection and a power generation facility, and also an eco center for recycling, as well as covering off the solid waste collection, as well as the uh, recycling collection as well in the city of Grand Prairie. We currently have a combination of water, wastewater, and distribution collection and uh, collection operations and maintenance contracts in different locations. And we'll talk a little bit about that here shortly. If I could have the next slide, please. Very fast. <laughs> she wants me to get through this very quickly. <laughs> Uh, so as far as shareholders, we're owned, we're a municipally owned corporation and we have four shareholders currently, the city of Grand Prairie, the county of Grand Prairie, the town of Sex Smith, and most recently the town of Wembley just joined in the last couple of years. We're independent and we're uh, governed by our independent board of directors. They're chosen by our shareholders. And again, at the end of the day, we're an independently operated uh, corporation, municipally owned corporation. That's our ownership. Where do we operate? So we have a number of different uh, locations and uh, we are expanding our operations locations. So we're centered and home based in the Grand Prairie region. And we have a number of uh, obviously locations and operations there. We have obviously the city of Grand Prairie, the county of Grand Prairie, Sex Smith and Wembley as we previously talked. We also have operated, we have operating contracts in Manning and also here in Jasper for the wastewater facility. We recently acquired some operations in Grand Cash, and we've operated for a few years in Hinton. We picked up Tech Coal recently because of the proximity to our Hinton operations, and uh, we had a fairly significant uh, expansion of our operations into Latasman, and that started as of this year. And being close to Millet, we are also providing some operational coverage for the town of Millet as well. 
So you can see we're starting to expand out. And obviously, Jasper is a very important location for us. Talk a little bit about benefits. So like I said previously, we're an arm's length corporation governed by an independent board of directors. Our our debt doesn't impact our shareholder debt capacity. So that's a very uh, good benefit for municipal uh, shareholders. We maintain the tax status as a municipally called controlled corporation. So that is also a good economic benefit of having a municipally owned corporation. We run as a competitive self-funding corporation. So we do uh, fund our own operations. We don't draw on our shareholders. We're a trusted operator and we focus on delivering high quality essential services to the region and to our new customers. Our company is focused very much on the communities where we serve. We're very uh, big proponents of being involved in the communities where we are and do operate. We offer essential utility services at median rates. It's a very important platform of our operation as we want to make sure that we are a benefit and not a detractor to where we operate. So it's important that our rates are competitive. And we also offer shareholders returns as, as uh, part of the benefits of owning Alcaterra. And we focus very much on our staff. So we have a very uh, highly motivated, professional, highly qualified staff. We, just recently exceeded 200 members in uh, employees. So we have fairly significant growth over the last two years. Talk a little bit about what we're trying to do here, our strategy. So our strategy is really is focusing on growing stakeholder value by effectively manage assets through the life cycle. Obviously important for us to embrace social responsibility. And we want to selectively prove pursue partnerships and leverage our core competency in utility asset operations. So it's very, very important for us. We are in a long cycle capital intensive business. So it makes uh, tremendous sense for us to focus on asset management over the long term. Our strategic priorities are operational excellence. If we can't do it well, we don't want to do it. Our focus is our customers and our stakeholders. It's very important for us to be highly engaged with our customers and the stakeholders and where we operate. One of the horse powers of Aquaterra is our people. So what one of our strategic priorities obviously is, probably very similar to your spoke, yourselves, is the culture and talent and leadership of our people. That's our horsepower. Anyone can buy trucks, anyone can build plants, but what we find the unlimited potential is our people. And when we focus on them, we can outcompete most folks. It's people. And obviously we wanna be financially successful. Next slide. Some of the challenges that are facing us, and I think it's facing uh, pretty much anyone in the municipal uh, space. Generally speaking, uh, the industry itself is aging and in some cases poor infrastructure. So most people don't want to spend money on water and sewer pipelines. They'd rather spend it on a new rink, new baseball diamond, a library. And so those tend to be the last in line for investment. Generally speaking, municipalities are short of cash and they have debt ceilings that make it pretty hard for them to reinvest in some of their infrastructure. Government funding is a challenge, whereas before government funding was relatively, not maybe not easy to get, but it was available to expand this infrastructure and to renew it is becoming less and less available. Lack of maintenance over time tends to be uh, in some areas, like I said, when it's underground, a lot of times it doesn't get fixed until it breaks. Another issue that's facing us globally is water, water scarcity and watershed issues. Whereas before the industry was pretty much a straight through industry, you'd collect the water from a source, you'd treat it and you return it. Now there's more pressure on closed cycle systems. And that has a big impact on people being accessing water and water quality. There's a requirement for more integrated water management. So there's a lot of folks, a lot of areas that are actually recycling. And there's a lot of closed systems, as I said earlier. The digital transformation is huge. So fairly large investments, but fairly big payoffs. If you're a smaller type of operation, it's hard to invest this type of capital to get these type of gains. So that is gonna be a continuing challenge facing municipalities. 
And obviously, as you know, there's increasing stakeholder pressure. So from an environmental perspective, customers want more, but they want you to take care of the environment better. So that obviously causes tremendous stress on systems, on companies, on all municipalities to provide these services. Increasing competition, definitely. We're seeing increasing competition in our industry as well. There's a lot of what I would say uh, amalgamation is happening. So a lot of these types of companies are coming in and buying up these assets. And unfortunately, they're getting less and less influence at the municipal level. Now that is a trend. I don't think it's really landed in Alberta as yet, but it is something that potentially will be coming here. People want to work and obviously we talked about our workforce. So it's very important that people are uh, have the ability of choice. So people have tremendous opportunities to work in a number of different industries, a number of different sectors, a number of occupations. There's a challenge getting people to work in these areas. They want to be in flexible work uh, arrangements. They want to be in flexible geographies. So it's really important to be able to provide that to employees going forward. And then obviously we have a whole bunch of issues around global warming, extreme weather events, those type of things, environmental events we're seeing, we're seeing more and more of those things. Utilities, municipalities have to be able to manage those. And it's causing more and more stress on the limited resources and funding that you have. And obviously at the end of the day, we're all in competition for good people. And as I said earlier, good people are the horsepower of our company and I'm sure they're the horsepower of your municipality. Let's talk a little bit about Jasper and Aquaterra. So, just some highlights. So we've been operating over 12 months since July of 2021. So thank you for that. Much appreciated. Uh, so some of the things, there's been no disruption during the transition and we assume the existing plan. So there's always a challenge and there's always a risk when you're taking over a different operation, right? There's things that you don't know, things that are, there's always surprises. Uh, Pardon me. Is that the bell that I've got two minutes left? <laughs> That would that be, that that right? that be the water that fell over here. Yeah. <laughs> it's a secret code. Okay, hurry up. Okay. So, uh, no, there's always a bit of a risk when you're taking over an operation. There's things you don't know. You try to do your best due diligence, but there's always things that you're not aware of when you're taking over things. And so we're very proud that there's been real no disruption during the transition. There's been no wastewater contraventions through the last year, which is obviously one of our highest priority or the highest priority to make sure that we obviously do the operation well, and there's no controversies from an environmental perspective. We've enhanced the safety culture with daily field lever hazard assessments and near miss reporting. So it's something that I think is really important. What we've implemented is for our folks to take a look at the workspace and to assess the hazards daily and do a field level hazard assessment. It's actually a requirement of the, of the code and the safety code and it's something that we obviously wanted to make sure our folks are doing. And the other thing we want to be more proactive and that's identifying hazards ahead of time. So identifying that we have a very formalized program, we have a software package that supports that where employees can identify hazards, tell us what they're going to do about it. If they need resources, we provide the resources to fix the hazard. But what it does, it also, it captures the learnings and transmits it to the other parts of our organization. The other parts of our organization are transmitting the safety learnings to this organ to the Jasper operation. And so ultimately, we're very proud of what we've been able to do so far with safety and more to come. We've upgraded the certification level all through operators. So we're very focused on making sure that our folks continually progress. So it's one of our main priorities. Uh, we see it as, as critical for our success. And we've been able to work with our folks and help them get development throughout the year. And we can see that continuing. We've also implemented the maintenance management in CityWorks. So it's a centralized computer software. It's an asset management system. So we put everything into the system. We put reporters into it. We can track history. So it tells us how we're doing on our plan maintenance, tells us where we're having issues in our equipment, and it allows us to schedule resources effectively. So it's a, in, in our minds, we've made a very heavy investment in this system over the last few years, and we're very pleased and proud that we implemented it here as well. Through the, uh, through the year, we've been able to engage our senior technical and supervision staff to help support the operation here. So we do have, like I said, we've, we've just exceeded 200 employees and it's a, it's a very highly qualified staff and, uh, and we can call on that staff to help if we have any issues or 
things we need to solve in Jasper. And so we've been able to do that over the last year. We've cross-trained the operators. So one of the things that we do is we believe in is cross-trained operators. So we operators tend to uh, operate. And uh, what our philosophy is, is when operators aren't operating, they can, they can supervise the plant, they can, they can do minor repairs on the plant. Eventually we train them up to do most of the, what we call the minor maintenance work. So we don't have to bring in external contractors and rely on external sources. They can do a lot of that work themselves. So we've been developing them and helping them in that, in that, uh, in that activity, all those activities. Process improvements, uh, one of the things we did work on was the, the alum consumption and cost. So we looked at optimizing alum consumption to get the right uh, quality coming out of the back end of the plant. If we can manage that, we can actually reduce costs over time. And at the end of the day, obviously it's good for the environment, for the product, or what, what we call the product we're, we're, uh, we're uh, delivering to the environment and also the input uh, costs of the plant and the footprint of the plant also reduces. And then also with some of our expertise, we've been able to support the Environmental Protection Enhancement Act approval renewal. So uh, we've, uh, we've got some very good folks in that area and they've been able to help us out here as well. And then also as a continuing focus of our growth strategy and at the end of the day, wanting to, to make sure we're providing the best service, we've actually recruited an area manager supervisor for this area. And uh, we're focusing on what we call the Elhead Corridor. And so we'll have a dedicated manager and area supervisor for this operation as well, where we've been working Sarah very hard and we really appreciate uh, all the work that she's done. Uh, it's not sustainable and we've made an investment in, uh, in some management folks in this area too. So those are just a couple of highlights. And I know I'm going through this fairly quickly, but I think you got the package ahead of time. So. Okay, uh, on the performance results. So these were the performance metrics that we came up with together, uh, working with your folks. And uh, so we've gone through and put a score against each one of those and I'll step through them. There's a fair bit of information here. So I don't uh, know if I'm gonna go through them in, in a whole lot of detail. Maybe I can just save it for questions. Maybe what I'll do is highlight a couple areas. Uh, the ones I, uh, what I'd say are in yellow. And then like I said, if there's some questions, I'm more than happy to go back to this page. If that works for you folks. Uh, one of the ones we have in yellow is on our first one, which is our actually supposed to be WCB reportable claims. The target is zero incidents, what is a safety incident to, to uh, the regulators. Zero would be 100%, uh, one inch in 75, two instances 50, and then uh, greater than two is zero. So it's a graduated scale based on uh, the incidents, the reportable incidents we have. Uh, we ended up with one incident this year, one safety incident in the last 12 months. It was an operator who uh, got a finger pinched in a door, and, uh, but it was uh, severe enough that it had to be reported. So we did report that. So that is one injury, uh, but we did, it didn't turn into a lost time. So the severity was low, but at the end of the day, the potential is there, so it needs to be reported. So that we had is yellow, because it's an area we obviously want to be green in and we want to have zero incidents. So we marked that as one incident in yellow, giving us a score of 7.5%. I'm going to skip down to the next one, the third one down, which is uh, asset maintenance. And so uh, the, the target for asset maintenance, i.e. PMs complete, which is preventative maintenance activities complete, greater than 90%. This is a very, this is a binary scale. So either you hit it, you get 100% or you miss it and you get zero. So I wouldn't have done very well in university on this scale. Uh, but at the end of the day, when we ended up doing, we ended up achieving about 75% completion of our PMs. The target is 90% greater than 90%, which is a very, very high standard. Uh, World-class preventative maintenance plan versus unplanned is about 80, 20. So this, you've got, we have a very high standard here. We ended up at 75% complete for the year. Uh, we did have uh, set up and some learning curves that we had to work through here. And there was a couple operational issues that challenged us. And so it did have an impact on our preventative maintenance program. Uh, as we focused near the end of the year, we started to bring those numbers up and we're seeing those numbers up where we'd like to see them. 98% going forward is still gonna be a very uh, serious challenge for us, but uh, we will strive to, to meet it. 
And then on the other ones, I think maybe just when I skip down to uh, environmental, because I think obviously that's very important. Uh, I'll cover a couple of these off here and that are green. Environmental approval limits. Uh, the target is number of months in compliance over the total number of months. And so there was one month where we weren't in compliance. We had a small reportable in that month. So we achieved 11 out of 12 months in total compliance. And we had one contravention in what we call it classified as administrative. And what that was, was uh, when we send testing tests in, there's a certain period of time in which that test has to be done by the lab and completed. Uh, if it isn't done within that time frame, then it's considered a contravention. Um, we sent in the test sample, the lab uh, didn't test it and didn't inform us that they weren't going to be able to test it because we could have potentially recovered. So that was what we call one administrative contravention. And so when we did the root cause, we determined that the lab wasn't sufficient to meet their quality standards. So we've changed the lab since then. So that's on the environmental side. Important to note here, we have, did not have any uh, contraventions on the operation itself in the wastewater quality, uh, leaving the facility. But I said, again, this is one administrative one. So I wanted to highlight that. And then just if I look on to the capital budget, how we're investing in the facility, how you're investing in the facility. Uh, two, there's two metrics around that. One is the budget. And as of, uh, as of when we put this together, all the projects that we are executing are trending towards being on budget. The second part of the capital metric is the actual schedule. And there was 22 projects on the list we took over. Uh, we took 10 into execution. Two we deferred as lower priority. So we didn't count those against us. Five of the 10 were completed and two were delayed pending some further funding. And one was delayed pending, uh, deliberately delayed pending additional engineering. So at the end of the day, we gave ourselves eight and a half or 10 on that uh, around timeline. And there's another slide here coming through on capital. And then the last one, the most important one is the transparency metric. And that's uh, that we come here every year and, and do a presentation to council and talk about uh, how we've done in the last year and obviously uh, answer any questions. So we're in the process of this. I gave myself and ourselves full marks on that. Uh, you know, if you want to mark us down, the presentation is up to your standards and that's fair. Ultimately, we ended up at 84 out of 100. Uh, you know, we, I think, believe the metric is 80%. So we, uh, we were able to, to beat the overall performance metric for the last 12 months. A lot of information on this slide, but like at the end of the day, um, uh, there's, a, there's a lot going on in the year. And I think this actually uh, is a fairly good mark for us for the first year. And like I said, if there's any questions, we'd be more than happy to have, answer them. Uh, here shortly. Just to, again, just touch and brief basically on the capital project summary. So uh, again, all the projects on our below budget. And uh, so what we've completed uh, are all listed here. And what we spent the heat, lace, heat trace upgrades, mixer replacement, security fence replacement, and temporary air conditioning ongoing is the water, which is a very significant uh, capital project. UV building and bank replacement and the process air blower. And then on hold, we, I talked about that we had a couple of projects on hold for either more engineering or potentially coming back for more funding as we're seeing, I'm sure you're seeing as well, increasing prices uh, based on um, obviously inflation and contractor availability. And then just touching on uh, just a couple of improvements we think potentially we can make or benefits going forward. So I think um, one of the things that we're doing as we're building out, we're very deliberate in our, in, our, in our strategy is building out our capacity. And, and what we're finding is there is a challenge to get uh, staff, skilled staff, whether it be professionals, whether engineering uh, professionals or skilled operators, and what we're finding as we're getting a little bit larger, obviously still focusing on the communities where we serve and providing good service, we're finding we're building ourselves more built-in capacity. So as we get larger, we're able to actually apply technology uh, at scale uh, and also apply people at scale. And we're seeing that as a benefit. So potentially what we see here is 
Is there potential as an opportunity to provide better service, better coverage for Jasper if we do a GP oversight solution and potentially reduce costs? And what that would include is essentially a 24 seven operation monitoring. Whereas right now we have daytime coverage and um, a lot of facilities, I come from the power industry originally, uh, one of the companies that I previously worked for monitors all its sites around the world for a central diagnostic center 24 seven. So you have somebody with eyes on the plant essentially 24 seven and can highlight troubles as potentially traditionally you'd have operators sleeping, right? Um, so it's a very effective way to monitor facility Potentially is something we could implement here. Probably something we'll obviously speak to your uh, folks here about in the future going forward. There's an opportunity to reclassify the Jasper facility to a level three. Right now it's classified as a level four, level uh, four, sorry. And it provides, the op it provides you as owners a little uh, greater flexibility, potentially particularly when we're moving into an era of uh, more restrict regulations higher the level of classification plant, the harder it is to meet the standards uh, and potentially some of the reclassifications or new regulations coming in uh, are harder and harder to meet and more and more expensive for smaller communities and smaller facilities to meet. So there's an opportunity here. You can still set your internal standards high, but at the end of the day, from a regulatory uh, perspective, it gives you a little bit more flexibility on where you invest your resources, how you set your standards and ultimately how you manage your plants. So there's a potential here to, to classify to level three as opposed to its current level, level four. And that could provide you with some flexibility going forward. Next one is increasing regional presence. Talked a little bit about that. Uh, as we grow out our business, there's opportunities to provide you with more skilled labor, uh, more access to technical people. And we see that as a benefit, not only to this facility, but to all of our facilities, all of our operations. And we're starting to see gains from that already. And then I think the other thing is uh, what we find challenging is recruiting, uh, recruiting in general, and particularly there is some challenges recruiting in this locale. So I think that what we would like to propose and look at is actually providing an opportunity for local people to develop the skill sets. So local operator recruiting. Uh, what we find in Grand Prairie, we do have challenges recruiting. And if we can get people locally and train them up, uh, they already have roots in the community and they tend to stay. So potentially it's something we'd like to look at introducing here as well. And then the last one is as we, as a corporation, as our board of directors uh, are, uh, and ourselves as senior manager are looking at ESG, global warming, the challenges, uh, we're taking more and more steps in this, in this um, arena. And we think potentially there is overflow benefits here, obviously for Jasper as we're operating here. And we'd like to bring those as we develop them for ourselves to all of our operations. So there's just some of the improvements, potentials and benefits we've we highlighted just uh, at a summary level. Um, that kind of concludes my presentation. And, and then, like I said, I would like to open it up for questions from council or administration. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Penn. Appreciate the presentation. Uh, I will turn it to councilors first. Are there questions for Mr. Ben? or his, I think he described him as more intelligent yes. <laughs> colleagues. <laughs> as as counselors, I'm sorry, yeah. Councillor Wilson, go ahead. Yeah, sure, just I'll start, it, start it off. I'm, I'm interested in the uh, the shareholder um, uh, process and like, so it sounds like, you know, you started off with, uh, I think just one uh, municipal shareholder and then it's kind of branched out to larger or to more and more um, communities, do you actively go out looking for more shareholders to be part of that group, or is that group kind of um, fixed at this point? So, I think, so uh, short answer is we're not actively looking for shareholders at this moment. Uh, what we are looking at doing is strategies twofold. Is one is uh, to expand our operations through operating contracts, similar to the one we have here. And then uh, we have uh, a requirement to come back to the board directors to determine whether or not we want to actually start acquiring. We've got tentative approval to acquire assets. And there's a number of different ways you can do that. Uh, a shareholder model is one way to do that. Um, at this point, uh, we're 
the board of directors and the existing shareholders aren't, aren't looking to do that at this point. Mm -hmm. Contract off of Parrot to Office. Thank you for that. I wanted to uh, speak specifically to the question of reclassification that you mentioned. So I presume that um, our current classification level four is not by accident. Somebody decided that that's what we should be or alternatively are required to be. Um, who, who gets to make the call about whether we can reclassify and how does that change of classification from four to three benefit either the municipality um, or Aquaterra or the environment? So the classification classification of your of the plant as it currently sits um, would have been ascertained through a, a assessment process with Alberta Environment. Um, they have a classification tool that is essentially assigned to a score which indicates which class the plant needs to be. And then from that, that dictates all how, how the plant needs to be operated, what parameters need to be met in order to satisfy um, the Environmental Protection Act. So with the current capital plans to upgrade the centrifuge and what that's going to allow us to do in terms of more specifically um, not compost, um, the centrifuge material, um, that changes how the plant would be classified in the numbering system, which would provide the opportunity to declassify or change the classification to a level three. Um, and with that, the parameters change and the needs that we need to meet in terms of the approval and meeting the environmental impact changes with that. Um, a level four operator, uh, which we are actually quite lucky to have several on staff in Grand Prairie, um, is difficult to find. We have seen that challenge with recruiting and having them move to the community here, um, which I'm sure is not new for any, anybody looking for skilled people to move to the community, it, it's difficult with housing. And so with that change, um, we actually have an operator who would be probably able to write their level three by the end of the year. And so it really changes the dynamic and how we're able to support the operations a little bit more in depth from the community rather than having to bring somebody in from the outside. Well, thank you for that. I, I greatly appreciate that response because you're absolutely right. Uh, we have experienced over the last 20 years the difficulty of recruiting for a level four operator. And uh, we appreciate that you have access to some, but it's been a challenge for this community. On the other hand, though, um, I was at least partially under the impression that that classification was set and not really amenable to change. So if you can find a way that we can get reclassified and still meet our environmental obligations. I'm excited to hear more about that as, as things unfold. We look forward to supporting you on that. Thank you for that. Thank you for that. Uh, Councillor Nolan. Thank you, uh, Your Worship. Um, you made reference to the centrifuge. Um, and I think there was another piece of equipment that we uh, also talked about replacement, which would occur in the fall um regarding the which is great that i think you can help me with that five hundred fifty thousand. is that what's being referred to in the uh, slide as to the capital um the uv building and bank replacement or is that another five hundred and fifty thousand? i think that's 
Yeah. Okay, and, and to your point about the level four, level three, this is one step along the way to be able to achieve that change or possibility of a change to be considered. Thank you. Other questions from councillors? Councillor Melnick? Um, as we are going into a capital budgeting budget cycle, um, it would be interesting to know what other changes in the plant that we should anticipate in the 2023 capital to be able to accelerate going to a level three plant or support that. Um, and I think it would be good to have that information uh, if we don't have it already. Good afternoon, Mayor and Council. Um, yes, we have been working on uh, the long-term uh, ten-year capital plan at the wastewater treatment plant, and we just had that completed last week. Um, and that's going to be part of our uh, going forward um, budget discussions um, coming up. Uh, just as uh, we've caught up on the major projects, just to give you a, a quick overview, we've caught up on our major projects with the. Uh, we do want the dewatering the and the UV um, tank replacement. And so next year, we do not anticipate that next two years, we don't anticipate near as much spending required at the wastewater treatment plant. So that'll be presented uh, during the budget. Thank you. Is the In the absence of other questions, I, I just had two, both relating to standards. Um, I noted in your slides that Jasper is the only location in which Aquaterra operates that is under federal jurisdiction. Is there any appreciable difference between the standard which must be met here in a national park compared to what you would meet or be required to meet elsewhere in the province? My understanding is that you are required here to meet the more strict requirement, whether it's Alberta environment or if there is a difference in a, in a federal standard. And so it, is that noticeable at all? And it, if it is a factor at all, does it make it more expensive to operate in a national park? <laughs> but John, John doesn't run anything outside of a national park. <laughs> Uh, there's there's the hierarchy of the legislation that applies um, to that. So some of the uh, federal rules uh, are more stringent than the AP, and that would uh, be the default position that we'd have to uh, meet. And that would be our obligation to meet. Uh, there's nothing uh, competitive between the two legislations. They're, they're just, a, um, again, a hierarchy, and they are quite overlapping. So. I don't think that um, their declassification of the plan to a level three would have any impact on either of those. Um, we did set our target parameters for the contract at pretty much twice as stringent as the uh, relevant uh, legislation. And the plant and its current operation, they're able to meet those, um, those guiding um, targets uh, as opposed to uh, the lesser standard of what's required. So we're the plants in um, better operation than legally required. Thank you for that. Um, the final question that I had about standards, and this is just confirmation. Uh, for the record, I, I hope to make it abundantly clear. You, you mentioned in the um, chart about performance results for Jasper, um, a contravention which you mentioned was administrative and in the previous slide, there was an indication that there was no wastewater treatment contravention. So just for clarity, I take it that you were never, or the plant was never out of compliance. You said there was one month where you, like the, the 11 twelfths graph that you gave us, there was one month where it was non-compliant, but that was simply an administrative um, reporting. And when the report came in late, it was still within the required parameters. Understood. 
Thank you for that. That, as as you indicated in your in your initial presentation, that environmental um, measurement is vitally important to us, and that's where we get if if ever we're going to get held to account with the operation of the wastewater treatment plant, it's going to be on the environmental side, and so it, it's critical. So I just wanted to make sure that that distinction was made clear that. The lab may have reported the results late, but the results were still within the permissible parameters. Yeah, and, and there's also um, there's kind of two levels of competition that we see within Alberta environment, right? There's um, kind of non what do we call it non non compliance, but there's like a material non compliance, and there's material, and then there's non material non compliance. And so there have been some non-material um, non-compliances throughout the year, um, but those would be like minor things such as, and we usually write, we write a seven day letter to Alberta Environment, those get submitted and they review them and say, yeah, this is, you put the right corrective action in place and we don't have a system. Yeah. Okay. Go ahead, Councillor Wilson. Yeah, I just have a question on um, uh, an equalization tank. What is it? Uh, will we eventually need it? Um, what is it? What do we get out of having it? And uh, why is it so expensive? <laughs> or should, should we be looking at, like, concerned about that in the near future? I can let John elaborate, but it's basically a holding tank for when you guys, so you guys are very seasonal and you have lots of peak flows associated with hotels and things like that. And so this is to help mitigate that impact in John. Mm -hmm. Your Worship, to uh, speak to Councilor Wilson's question. Um, we have the notice that um, to improve the efficiency and the operation of the wastewater plant, um, ideally you want nice steady uh, flows. Um, and um, so we, we monitor uh, a lot of the operations, um, plant speed, um, influent um, rates and such. We do have an issue where we have um, the pipe that, uh, one of the pipes that comes from um, into our system, uh, it creates a surge um, anywhere from 19 to 23 times a day. Uh, so that surge, um, it'll increase our flow from maybe 40 liters a second uh, when we hit those surges, they they um, bring our plant up to an additional 110 liters a second on top of what our normal steady state flow is. So um, we did, conducted a study in 2019 with Morrison Hirschfield uh, regarding op options that we could investigate to reduce our um, energy requirements uh, because the, as these high surges come in, um, all of our plant uh, has to ramp right up. So we um, increase um, our energy demand significantly, bringing those pumps up to speed. And some of the pumps that we have, like they're not small pumps. So we're talking 150 horsepower pumps um, with increased uh, demand. So ideally we would like to harmonize our flow. We looked at uh, several options um, that were uh, potential to reduce the flows that are going in and the and one of the um, the most preferred one at this point is the um, expansion of a header tank or an expansion tank. Um, in effect, it would be replacing a 16 inch sewer main that's kind of running into the plant. We would upsize that with a three meter inch or three meter diameter um, pipe for um, uh, about 200 meters. And that would allow the surges um, to kind of act and I just had a tank. And then we can introduce the influent at a steady rate, um, which would reduce our uh, the strain on our uh, biological system. So it's, um, to say it's not going to be as hard on the bugs that we need uh, to do the treatment um, of the plant. Uh, it'll also reduce our electricity uh, demand significantly. Um, we were just in a meeting this morning um, and for a system such as ours, uh, we pay um, 
as, as we hit peak demand, our rates ratchet and they hold that highest demand for a period of 12 years. Every time we increase that demand, our rates ratchet to the next level. And so um, just by, able, by being able to reduce the flow into the plant at a steady state, we're talking about a savings of roughly $140,000 per year on electricity costs in the world. Um, it'll be a more harmonized flow going into the plant and uh, easier to operate, uh, certainly. Um, yeah, and it, and it reduce our uh, chemical dosing. And so that's why this has become a preferred option. And we figured that would be paid for um, not only in our, our savings, um, energy savings over time, but just all the operational upsets uh, that we get. So it's, it's just to harmonize those peak flows that we get several times per day. Mr. Mel. Thank you, Your Worship. Um, Mrs. Gray, did I, was that 12 years you said? That, that, did I hear that correctly? That that when the flow is high, it, it's reset for a period of, is it, was it 12, 12 years? Uh, sorry, Councilman Monick, sorry, it's a, it's a 12 month. They oh, can ratchet it up to the next. Uh, yeah, okay. so, yeah. It's it basically once you hit the level, you're there for 12 months, it gets reset and then it goes back. And but, but it stays the next highest level, um, you know, that you've shown them in your last 12 months. So right. it's, con it's constantly a rolling uh, process. Yeah, so you have significant savings if you could go for a period of time and, and, and have that reduced. Right, um, and that's that's where we notice our flows. So, you know, um, peak time, we may be uh, sitting at 70 to 80 liters a second produced by the community, uh, but then we have these, these peak flows and that adds another 110 liters per second going into the plant. So it, where our optimum energy um, usage would sit, it's right at the lower uh, third of the band of our actual usage and our billing uh, information in the cycles. So we're paying for these peaks that are actually sitting at the bottom third of our curve. So that's that's where we um, where we contacted um, EPCOR, guided the uh, process for the hydraulic review of the wastewater system, and uh, the expansion tank is uh, the preferred option going forward. And appreciate that. Um, if I may continue with the uh, change that is in the campground with the addition of more showers and more washing facilities and so on. This is a really quite a timely project to be looking at reducing flow since I, I think over the next 20 years, we're gonna see continued high effluent. Thank you. Councillor Hall. Thank you, Mayor Island. My question is, when you're talking about peak flows, do you mean per day in the day or the month or is it or what's a big problem? What is it daily? A daily peak flow? Or uh, monthly or yearly? We have these peak flows anywhere from 19 to 23 times per day. So it's an almost hourly event. Um, and that's really does shorten the lifespan of our pumping, um, our pumping uh, equipment. Uh, the high amperage demand uh, to ramp up and then ramp back down. Um, ideally, uh, a wastewater pump is designed to last 30 to 35 years, happily spinning along at one speed. Uh, we're noticing that we're, our life cycle is probably 13 years before we're noticing uh, pump performance issues where we're sending them out to be uh, rebuilt, uh, the stators uh, rewound and everything like that. All right, well, thank you all. It appears that we have exhausted our questions and perhaps we've exhausted you as well. But thank you for your, for your patience with all of those. Um, I do appreciate the, uh, the important um, presentation to us today. Uh, first of, of many more to come, I trust. And just speaking personally um, on the metric of transparency, I will not grade you down a bit. I, I think this is 100% what, what we expect and what we need. So 
thank you very much. It's been very transparent and uh, a good learning opportunity for all of us. So thank you very much. Thank you, Your Honor. Thank you, Justice. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you. And during that, we had another guest. Um, oh, yes, thank you. And it's right there in front of me on the brand new agenda. <laughs> All right, um, might I have a motion um, that council receive the presentation from Aquaterra uh, for information? Council Nolan? I'd be happy to make that motion. All those in favor? There are none opposed, that is carried. And as I was saying during that presentation, um, we enjoyed the, uh, the walk-in appearance of one Mr. Gerald Soroka, who I'm, I'm sure is delighted now um, to realize that having moved from municipal politics to federal politics, he no longer has to worry about wastewater and uh, the downstream impact of that. Um, but welcome, Mr. Soroka. Thank you very much. And thank you, Susan, for, for coming to visit us. I appreciate that uh, you're in town giving out the Queen's Jubilee um, medal. So thank you for including our community and citizens of our community in that. And thank you for showing up today. Um, we don't mean to um, tax you too hard here. Um, it's nice to have you attend a meeting. Um, and I ask that you do that in order that we can present something to you. Absolutely. So, and by the way, uh, Mayor Ireland, you are incorrect that I still worry about wastewater <laughs> because there are other communities that do look for funding. So trust me, that is always on the list of uh, municipalities across my ride. Right. Well, if you need more information then on centrifuges and primary clarifiers and fans that, well, stuff hits the fan, as you know, and we have that deal to deal with here. And, uh, and now apparently um, something else, um, an equalization tank. So we can, we can help educate you for all those other communities uh, that you have to deal with. But that aside, um, if you want to come forward, I have something for you. So Gerald's office contacted us uh, recently and indicated that it would be really nice when Gerald has visitors in his Ottawa office um, coming to talk about wastewater or other things, <laughs> um, that he be able to present a really nice photograph of Joshua. So we got this photograph and I would like to oh. present that to wow, Gerald nice. and he can then put that on his office wall and get back to. Oh, Ottawa. we gotta come close. But you come forward. Just <laughs> remember. There you go. <laughs> Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Ireland. I appreciate that. And council, it will be very nice to hang up. Actually, I have to admit, you got I have it. I've had, <laughs> I've had a few people during COVID. I didn't have really anybody coming into the office. Obviously, uh, since that time, my walls are a bit more sparse than other uh, MPs in the area. They've uh, served for many years, so I'm. Probably I, I get asked a bit, uh, gee, did you just move into your office? And no, no, I've been here over two years already. <laughs> so this will be a very nice addition and thank you very much. Uh, as well as besides presenting me with a picture, I appreciate that. Uh, Susan has uh, will be passing out some uh, swag to you guys as well. So a little our, our appreciation too. <laughs> Sorry for turning my back on you guys. I didn't know you <laughs> well. I notice you're wearing a pin that's not a Jasper pin. So oh, you, you have to. Yeah, uh, this, to fix this, that. this pin is a little different than most. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Yeah. 
but that's, well. that's for Susan. I okay. thank you very much. Then. She's giving up swag. She deserves some swag. Okay. And she gets to be on camera, which she never <laughs> likes to be, by the way. Oh, thank you so much. I'm going to grab you a Just, yeah, thank you. just oh, circulate yeah. the picture because Collins oh, haven't seen, seen it. it as well. And just for your own information, that's an aerial shot of Rosh Ron, which is across from Disaster Point. So as you drive back east today, um, you can look across the valley and see that. But you won't see it from this angle because no. only airplanes or drones get up to that level. But, uh, but there, there may have been a time when uh, Mayor Ireland and myself and the Mayor of Hinton did go on a helicopter ride one time. and. He gave us astounding tour of which direction the helicopter should go in to see some of the scenery. So I'd like to very much thank you for that. No, we were looking for a pine beetle tree. Well, that's what it at was. Scenery. It was for the pine beetles. To, that's what I meant by the scenery, the devastation of the pine beetles. Sorry. Well, thank you very much for that. And just, uh, Gerald, just before you leave, as our MP and as uh, one of your constituents, we have an individual here. What was that? Please start. Sorry, as as our member of parliament, um, I'd just like you to know that you have uh, a constituent here who would like to say something to you. I would like to take this opportunity to thank you and your office. I believe it was Allison and Edson. Um, who played a significant role in getting my daughter's passport. Yes. So she graduated high school on June 29th. We were able to pick it up the next day at 4.30 and she flew on the second degree. So thank you very much. And pass it on please to Allison as well. I, I very much appreciate that, Councillor Hall. And to be honest with you, it's, it's quite sad that they knew passports were coming and uh, they've had to go and do these work. They said if you're flying anything over 20 or 48 hours, well, that's not, that's, you got time. <laughs> and it's shocking that, you know, most of us think of our passports expiring. We want to get it within that six months beforehand. And yet they're talking, no, no, if you're doing anything more like 72 hours, oh, please don't even try. That's, that's lots of time. But so it's kind of surprising that that's happened. And, it's starting to work through a little better now. We're up to a couple days now. So it's up to 20 days now if you uh, are going to be flying. But it's still kind of sad that uh, we're that far back long. So I'll pass on to Allison, absolutely. And she is basically the passport expert now <laughs> in our my writing office. So uh, it's great to hear and uh, pass it on. And did she enjoy your trip? She had a wonderful time, yes. <laughs> Perfect. Yeah. Right, unless, sorry, unless you have uh, anything for us, um, Gerald, just thank you so much for, for taking time to visit the community. We always appreciate you coming here and the residents really appreciate the attention that you pay to them as, as you did today and uh, a week or two ago when you presented those same uh, Jubilee, um, Queen's Jubilee methods to two other individuals in our community. And I understand that you perhaps have one more to, to present yet, or are you done now? Uh, not there is one more uh, recipient in Jasper. Unfortunately, she's in uh, Manitoba right now. Uh, she her mother passed away, so she'll be coming back sometime in the future once she settles up those affairs, and I'll be presenting one more as well. So I don't want to disclose the name because you know it's not official. Yet, so. But that will be coming forward, and I'll let you know at that time as well. Perfect. Well, another opportunity for you to be back in the community. So. Actually, it's very nice to come to Jasper. I very much enjoy the mountains. Unfortunately, I live three hours east of here. So on the right hill, on the right day, I can just see the peaks. So it's <laughs> not quite the same as being here. Uh, if there's any questions that council has for me on other topics besides the Queen Jubilee pins, I'm open to that as well. We hadn't intended to put you to work. Just, um, just to recognize you and give you something to hang in the wall. Okay, um, maybe I will give a little highlight then sure. what I've been working on, as well as um, uh, Mayor Ireland, you know, in the summer or this uh, April there, we did have a bit of a meeting with uh, the tourist providers in the area, as well as with Mayor Ireland. 
and a few others. And we're looking at what we can do to make Jasper a better place and some of the issues working with Parks Canada. And from that meeting, um, I've been working with uh, Patty on the, at the chamber and we're gonna be writing a report together and we're gonna be presenting that sometime in February. Uh, we'll have a summit here in Jasper with the stakeholders of the Minister of Environment, potentially more likely the Minister of uh, Tourism. And that will be inviting and this way we can present that report as well as, you know, from the issues that the municipality of Jasper has, uh, you know, tourist operators, home operator businesses, and a lot of that. So we can actually maybe start working better with the federal government as opposed to the peace make meal that we've been doing. And this way it's formalized of what everyone needs or wants. So I hopefully, I think Mr. Given, you have been in contact as well and put your uh, input forward. So that's very much appreciative. So I'm looking forward to that. And I know you'll be part of that uh, meeting as well then there, Ireland. Yes, and, and thank you uh, for your ongoing engagement in that. And it started with a visit from the uh, shadow ministers in the spring, as you said, that you spearheaded. So that was a great initiative and it's, it's going to flourish into something even better. So we, well, we do appreciate that. Well, we're hoping it is because I mean, we have to work with the government that's in place right now. And um, hopefully once we bring all these issues forward, they'll take serious action and we can get a lot of those things addressed. And if not, I, I know you've got a big stick, so you'll know how to treat that properly. Then. <laughs> With that, thank you very much for the uh, picture. I will definitely hang that on my wall. And if there's any other issues or concerns you have, please, you know how to reach me. I'm more than capable of helping you. And thank you, Councillor Hall, for those kind words as well. Right. Thank you. Appreciate you your time with us today. Thank you again. Thank you, Susan. Yeah. Yeah. Have a great afternoon. All right. Uh, Councillors, we can return to our agenda. We are at uh, agenda item six, new business. Uh, we have a recommendation coming forward from Committee of the Whole um, with respect to the Jasper Employment and Education Center request regarding the Rural Renewal Stream Initiative. Uh, any further discussion or questions for administration about that particular initiative? If there is nothing, is there a counselor prepared to make the motion as recommended? Councillor Wax, are you, are you ready? You've got your mic on. That council approve municipal representation on the proposed stakeholder committee as presented by the Jasper Employment and Education Center in regards to the rural renewal stream initiative. Thank you for that motion. Is there any debate? I will call the question. All those in favor? There are none opposed. That is carried. Um, Mr. Given, we still have some time to sort out the details of that. what that representation is going to look like. Your Worship, yes. Uh, my understanding um, from the presentation at committee was that they really needed confirmation that there would be municipal representation. Uh, in order for them to uh, submit a file to the appropriate authorities. Uh, so now with this confirmation that they will do so, uh, and this is how we can decide who that would be if they get into this discussion over there. If a member of council, which member of council, and then uh, for the administrative uh, either support or representation, I think that can still be decided at a later date. Uh, this doesn't include the municipality to be a partner in participating on this, uh, on this committee. And I think that's exactly what the Jasper Employment Education Center and is this motion now something that can be tracked on the motion action list just so we don't lose sight of the fact that although we passed the motion we haven't really finished the, the discussion and i just don't want to lose track of the fact that there are some some loose ends 
Thanks, Your Worship. Uh, that it's, it doesn't fall in the typical format, but uh, I think what we would do is maybe we could just add this as an agenda item to the upcoming council as a whole, and then uh, even with other administrative report to council at that time, we could have a discussion with who they might like to have uh, represent uh, council, and uh, so we've had this to the council to have a discussion. Sure. Thank you for that. All right, uh, agenda item eight. Councillor reports. Do we have reports other, other than, I'm sorry? Yeah, item seven. Oh, I'm sorry, I, I missed item seven is uh, notices of motion. There is nothing um, scheduled, um, but this is something to which councillors will become accustomed over time, but this would be an opportunity for councillors to bring forward a notice of motion um, to be discussed for the future meeting just to to confirm that councillors always have an opportunity to get matters on our agenda there is nothing scheduled for today if somebody wanted to add something um, we could entertain it but uh, it's a placeholder to allow that opportunity councillor wilson not a notice of motion but just to speak to that um it, i think uh previous practice was that we would notify um council that we were going to make a motion uh, is it possible, like, are we able to make motions uh, off the cuff, or, or do we still want to stick with the, um, I think, contact to notify prior to, uh, you know, the, the meeting? My expectation is that we would do our best to provide as much notice as possible. There may be occasions where notice wouldn't be possible if something happened prior to the meeting, but after the deadline for submissions for the agenda, um, you could always ask permission to ask something and that would be up to the will of council, I think. But yeah, the, the intent would be if, if a councillor wishes to have a matter added as a notice of motion that they would, I think the, the written process is that they would contact the uh, CAO with that notice prior to, is it four o'clock on Wednesday, um, preceding the, uh, the Friday of the agenda development. And we did not change those terms in the procedural bylaw. Uh, Thank you for raising that, uh, Councillor Melnick. I apologize, but now I will say that agenda item seven has been dealt with, and I will go to agenda item eight and ask again for any councillor reports. Other than the baseball tournament. <laughs> Councillor Wilson. Uh, Mr. Gibbon, may I ask uh, when the next uh, Cups? Mm -hmm. Yes, Councillor Wilson, I believe we have uh, Cups being the acronym for our commercial small space task force, uh, which is great. One of the best acronyms for something that's often focused on food beverage. Uh, <laughs> but the, uh, the Cups task force uh, meeting is uh, scheduled for the 31st of the week. Thank you. Well, the absence of reports probably means that uh, people took advantage of the slight summer break that we offered this year, which was great. So thank you for that. Uh, agenda item nine is upcoming events. Are there events not listed that any councillor is aware of that they would like to bring to the attention of council? And I did hear some discussion earlier about the um, Alberta Municipalities Convention and Trade Show in Calgary in September. And that does conflict with our regularly scheduled <coughs> council meeting on whatever day it is early that week, yeah. um, a travel day. So are we, are we scheduled for that Tuesday? And are we at risk of not having quorum? Your Worship, I believe we do have a number of members of council uh, away that have planned on attending. I think at least three members of council, which would make it pretty tight. Um, and so, council may wish to consider whether uh, we want to uh, cancel that regularly scheduled meeting. Um, that's something we can have a bit of a look at and bring out advice to your community. 
Thank you. We we still have time if we're going to cancel that to meet the requirements and we'll get it canceled, but we should look at it specifically to see whether that is a need. So if that could come back, say for next week at Committee of the Board. Councillor Hall. Thank you, Mayor Ireland. I would also like to add for upcoming events the Jasper Folk Music Festival, which will be September 9th and 10th this year. Councillor Melnick. I would be remiss that we didn't recognize the 30th annual Great Duck Race, <laughs> which will be on Sunday, September 25th. Councillors will be back from those who are attending in Calgary will be back and should be able to attend the race. That is a, uh, it is interesting that it's gone 30 years. It's just been fun to see kids watch the ducks go in the water. Two great um, societies benefit from this fundraiser, and that is the Right to Read Society and the Jasper Yellowhead Historical Society as well. So, um, that is the Sunday, September 25th. And uh, tickets are available at the museum and also at the uh, at the uh, Wednesday Farmer's Market. And if you happen to see a counselor, much like myself, I will be pursuing people in the community to uh, support the event. Thank you, Councillor Melnick. Um, if there are no further upcoming events of note, um, we next have an in-camera meeting um, to discuss the position that we might take with respect to the proposal to alter boundaries for electoral um, constituencies. I can advise council that we have received confirmation um, that um, we have been accepted to present uh, an oral submission at the hearing scheduled for BAMP on September 23rd. Um, so I will commit to do that as I'm not going to be at uh, the Alberta Municipalities event in Calgary, as are many of you on that day. But what we have yet to discuss, which becomes a strategic priorities discussion is the position that we will take um, at that presentation. So that is why we have that scheduled for an in-camera meeting today. So I wonder whether I might have a counselor um, make a motion that we move in camera at 2.48 p.m. Councilor Hall, thank you for that. All those in favor? There is no one opposed, that is carried. So I will let um, those who are watching on our Zoom link that council will now move in camera for a discussion just regarding federal electoral districts, um, at the end of which we will come back into open session and I presume um, do nothing other than adjourn this meeting. So there'd be no need for anyone else to, to worry about Zooming back in. So I thank everyone who attended remotely today. Um, and look forward to welcoming everybody back again next Tuesday morning for Committee of the Whole at 9.30. Thank you all.